the Apollo Story One. Welcome to our channel. Whether you're a new viewer or a subscriber, we appreciate your support. Please take a moment to like and comment on our content so we can continue to improve and offer the best service possible. And if you're new, hit that subscribe button to stay up to date with our latest videos. Thanks for joining us, and without further ado, let's head down to Earth. This story is a testament to the unwavering bravery and significance of individuals like Alex Serbos. He's not just an above-average pilot, but a man with a unique blend of skills and character traits that set him apart. As time and space unfold, his courage will shine through, proving him to be a pivotal figure. This is not just a story of mankind's journey across the cosmos, but also a tribute to the unsung heroes who make it possible. Chapter 1 in the year 2605, Earth's population skyrocketed to a staggering 13 trillion, sending shockwaves through the planet. Despite triumphing over the human past, humans have overcome their challenges overcoming wars, polluting the planet, and abolishing slavery and racism by passing strict laws that took away some people's freedoms and human rights, inequality and sexism over many years. Human leadership has improved because of its great diversity. Earth is not just a home anymore, it's a crowded space struggling with overpopulation. With over 80% of its surface already occupied, 20% of the oceans filled with human life, and 10% of the lakes and rivers claimed, the planet is teetering on the edge of a critical issue. The average lifespan of humans has exceeded 200 years, intensifying the urgency of the situation. This is the backdrop against which our story unfolds. Humanity in a daring and ambitious move, has shifted its focus towards space exploration and human colonization, leading to the creation of the groundbreaking Apollo Project. The Apollo Project, a monumental endeavor by humanity, is not just about exploring the universe and establishing human colonies. It's a beacon of hope, a symbol of our collective ambition and determination. To achieve this goal, Huge spacecrafts called Apollos are being constructed in Earth's orbit. These Apollos are not just ordinary ships, but marvels of engineering, designed to withstand the harsh conditions of space and carry humanity's hopes and dreams to the stars. The first ship, Apollo 1, is set to be deployed within the next 12 months. The scale of this endeavor is immense, with 10 fleets each assigned an Apollo. These will be commanded by master fleet admirals and supported by a team of 40,000 vessels, including carriers, battleships, cruisers, and various other ships. The Apollo Command ship, which weighs over 60 trillion tons, is designed to accommodate over 10 million civilians. It will provide a self-sustaining environment similar to that of a city on Earth, complete with amenities, agriculture, and even military capabilities. The military power of Apollo is classified, but it can cloak its armaments and weapons. Apollo will be the first colony vessel from Earth. The seventh fleet of the Earth is located in San Diego, California. It also houses more than 90,000 ships and over 2.3 million military personnel, including airmen, engineers, Marines, and special ops units. The commanding officer of Apollo 1 is Master Fleet Admiral Bishop Serbos, known by the call sign Big Boss. He is a tall and commanding figure, standing at approximately 6 feet 5 inches, with salt and pepper colored hair, weighing around 260 pounds, and possessing icy gray eyes that exude control. His team holds him in high esteem, and, and he is renowned for leading by example. There are rumors that in combat, Big Boss got big balls. Fade out, day. Fade in. The next day began with a loud thunderstorm that startled the Admiral awake. He gazed towards the large bedroom window and sat up on the edge of the king-size bed. As he stood up, he realized that his wife Sandra was not present in the room. However, he could smell the aroma of coffee brewing, so he knew where she was. He put on his slippers and went downstairs, following the scent of coffee to the kitchen. He found Sandra standing by the sink, looking out the window at the rain. The Admiral approached her, wrapped his arms around her, and kissed her neck softly. 
Sandra was a little surprised but turned to face him with a smile and said, Good morning, big boss. They hugged and started laughing together. Their son Alex walked into the kitchen and said, You two, get a room. We eat in here, Alex sat at the table, and Sandra and Big Boss joined him. Sandra asked Alex, So what's new with you, Alex, began eating his breakfast. Sandra asked Alex about his plans for the day. Alex replied that he had planned to hang out on the beach, but the rain had spoiled his plan. Sandra then asked if there was any news at work. Alex replied that there was nothing new. Big Boss then revealed that they were reassigning pilots, and Alex's current assignment would be one. Alex protested, saying that he had just gotten used to his new command and fighter squad, and that this would be a significant setback for him. The Big Boss assured him that he never interfered with commands, especially those involving Alex and his father's fleet commands. Alex responded with frustration, and the big boss asked if he had checked his military cloud messages. Alex pulled out his iPhone and was surprised by the notification he received. He said couldn't believe what he was reading. He smiled widely and exclaimed, Report to the USSS Kennedy on Monday, June 5th, 2605. This is amazing. It's my dream ship. Alex said Sam and Marshall are on board the Kennedy as we. Big Boss commented, I had nothing to do with that, but you can always live with your mom and sister. Alex quickly rejected the offer and left the room smiling. Sandra asked Big Boss when they could fly up to Apollo, and it was next week good to see the house and the neighborhood. Big Boss suggested how about tomorrow, as the rain was expected to be gone by then. Sandra was pleasantly surprised and asked if he was serious. She also inquired about any people living there. Big Boss confirmed that the full city was now operational and technicians, military personnel, and their families were aboard. Apollo was about 95% ready for space travel. Big Boss arranged for a military flight taxi in the morning. Sandra was thrilled and agreed to ask Sharon if she would like to come along as she would be attending classes there. Sharon is Sandra and Big Boss's daughter, Alex's younger teenage sister. The following morning, the family gathered around the breakfast table at 8 a.m. Alex asked if everyone was packed and ready to go. Sharon asked if Alex wasn't going with them. Alex replied that it was only for the younger kids, laughing. Sandra then asked Alex about his plans for the day. Alex said that he would report to Kennedy. The big boss said Alex just couldn't wait and asked him to pass on his regards to Admiral Tillis. The big boss also mentioned that they would be on the Apollo for a few days and would return on the following Sunday. Alex wished them all a safe trip. At that moment, the comms rang from the door. A. Big Boss answered the door. At the door was a Marine Major and two First Lieutenants were waiting. They all gave a snapping salute to the Admiral and said, Good morning, sir. The Big Boss greeted them and asked them to be at ease. The Major informed the Admiral that they had arrived to take him and his family to the Apollo. One of the Lieutenants asked if they would carry any luggage to which the big boss replied in the affirmative. The officers then entered the house to retrieve the luggage, and the Admiral Sandra and Sharon left to get in the taxi. The family hugged and greeted each other goodbye. Later, Alex took a shower, dressed, and gathered his equipment before heading to the USSS Kennedy. When he arrived at the military complex in San Diego, he entered the aircraft fighter complex. As he approached his fighter, he could see how massive the complex was. After an hour, Alex climbed into the cockpit of his fighter and entered the catapult tube. From the control platform, a voice announced, Lieutenant Serbos, you have clearance to the USSS Kennedy, you have a go. Alex accelerated his fighter to Mach 3.5 and launched into orbit. 
After 20 minutes, he contacted the USSS Kennedy and requested permission to dock. The USS Kennedy comms responded, Roger Black Hawk. The platform is clear to land. Alex turned his fighter toward the massive carrier. Banking to his left, he boarded the Kennedy. Once aboard, he then reported to his quarters and took a nap. Later, he called his parents to let them know that he had safely boarded the Kennedy. During their conversation, Alex's mother mentioned their new house, the human-like android named Nancy, who worked as their housemate and their spacious pool and great neighborhood. Alex joked that he should have gone with them. He then spoke with his father, who had already informed Admiral Tillis of the Kennedy about Alex's arrival and suggested that Alex visit the Apollo when he had some time off. Alex promised to do so once he learned more about his orders. Lastly, his father asked if Alex had seen Samuel and Marshall yet, to which Alex replied that he had just woken up and planned to find them around dinner. After their conversation, Alex and his father ended the call. Alex rested in bed for a few hours before activating his room comms to request information about the ship's whereabouts. He called the officer Blackhawk through the comm system and asked for the location of Lieutenant Samuel Gills. Blackhawk informed him that Gills was in quarter 36, deck 10. After ending the call, Alex put on his jacket and left his quarters to meet Samuel. As soon as Samuel opened the door, they greeted each other with a big bear hug and laughed like two school kids. Samuel was surprised to see Alex and asked him what he was doing there. Alex replied that he had been reassigned to the Kennedy, and Samuel was overjoyed to hear that. They both expressed excitement about flying together again. Alex then asked about Marshall's whereabouts, and Samuel informed him that they were meeting for dinner in the next hour. They decided to surprise Marshall and have dinner together. When Alex and Sam walked into the dining room, they saw Marshall sitting at a table. Marshall noticed them and stood up with a big grin on his face, saying, You kidding me? They hugged each other and patted each other on the back. After getting their meals, the three officers returned to their table. They all agreed that it was good to see each other again. Marshall mentioned that it had been a while since they had flown together. Alex complimented the food, saying that it both looked and tasted great. At that moment, they noticed Admiral Tillis entering the room. Sam pointed out that he was known as the Godfather. Admiral Tillis bore a striking resemblance to Alex's father. The Admiral approached their table and asked if he could join them. The three lieutenants welcomed him to sit with them. During the conversation, Alex, his father, and I discussed his involvement. Alex responded with a respectful yes. Sir, the Admiral then asked three lieutenants how things were going, to which they replied great. Admiral Tillis remarked that the carrier was one of the best in the world fleets. He also inquired whether the three lieutenants were part of the same fighter squadron, to which Alex replied that he was not sure and would receive his orders the following day. Admiral Tillis responded positively, saying that he, Alex's father, and the three lieutenants had flown together for many years and had a few fighters blown off from under their asses, which elicited laughter from the group. Alex, a little advice the Admiral said, don't be as daring as your dad was. I saw him do things that no man could and shouldn't do. I have watched him for 30 years. We were about the same ages as you, three. Alex replied to the Admiral, well, sir, I heard you did some unbelievable things as well, according to my dad. Okay, well, I saved his ass a couple of times, said the Admiral. I recall he was almost late for his wedding and Sandra was steaming. Everyone laughed and went on to eat their meals. The next morning, Alex woke up to find his comm system blinking. He checked the cloud message that informed him of his assignment to report to the Black Squadron and provided him with the carrier's GPS location. Fade out end of part one. Later that day, Alex arrived at the Black Squadron conference room and was pleasantly surprised to see Sam and Marshall there. They exchanged greetings and caught up on old times. Although Alex suspected that Admiral Tillis was behind his orders, he was thrilled to reunite with his old friends. 
Master Fleet Admiral Serbos arrived at the Apollo headquarters for a quarterly meeting with all the commanding chiefs aboard the Apollo 1. From right to left Chief General of Ground Operations is General of the Army William Wright from USA. General Wright will ensure that all military complexes and ground batteries are in place across the planet. He is responsible for all tactically built and in place military bases, including the Army, the Marine, the Air Force, and the Space Navy. All ground radar systems and communications are globally in place. This department will also be responsible for all weapons factories. Chief Admiral of the Fleet is Admiral Jake Tillis from USA. Admiral Tillis has been appointed to oversee and monitor all activities related to space systems. This includes managing satellites, fleet command, probes, expeditions, naval tactics, early warning and communication systems, space-to-air communications, and tactics connection to planet communications. In addition, he will be responsible for all space patrols, space stations, and any contact with alien entities. The following is a list of individuals who will be leading various departments to ensure the success of planet expansion. Admiral Tosa Reizen of Japan will serve as the Chief Admiral of Transportation. His main responsibility will be to oversee the delivery of all necessary materials to various locations across the planet. He will work closely with other departments to ensure that all transportation needs are met. General Siminya Li Yong of China will be in Sarah has been appointed as the head of the Engineering, Communication and Logistics Department. Her team's main objective is to construct roads, buildings, and improve agriculture. They will closely collaborate with Admiral Ryzen to establish new towns and cities across the planet. Additionally, they will ensure that water and power services are provided to all communities. To ensure the safety of the inhabitants, wooden buildings will be prohibited. General Ross Turner of the USA will serve as the There is a new position available the Executive Officer Master General of Civilian and Military Personnel. This person will have a lot of responsibilities, including overseeing education, employment, health and human services, hospitals, housing, departments, internal affairs, and advertisements for towns, cities, new homeowners, and businesses. They will also be responsible for community services and crime prevention. In other words, this individual will be in charge of ensuring the overall success of the planet and will work closely with the big boss. Chief General of Planetary Resources General Scott Young will be in charge of finding planet minerals, gas, and unknown resources. Chief of Science and Research Chief Medical Doctor Luktiva Mikhail Rush's Doctor Luktiva Department will conduct research on land, sea, ocean, and space, performing conventional and non-conventional tests. Before civilians can be released on the planet, a series of tests will be conducted. The process of terraforming the planet to match Earth's environment will take up to six months. Once completed, civilians will be able to live on Apollo for up to a year. Military personnel and their families are also welcome to stay. Master Admiral Serbos entered the High Command Conference Room. Everyone stood to attention. Big Boss, please everyone be seated. I won't take much of your time, I read everyone's reports. It looks as if we are still on schedule or a little ahead of schedule. Does anyone have questions for me? Sir Responding Admiral Tosa Raisin, when will the civilian pickup start? Big Boss stated he spoke with Admiral Tillis the pickup should start next week. Big Boss said, Jake, can you give us an update? Admiral Tillis spoke the pickups will start next week, and the families have been informed. We will start with Africa and Europe next week, Russia and China the week after. Brazil and other South American countries, followed by the Middle East and Southeast Asia. Japan, Australia, Canada, and the USA will be the final pickup. Last but not least, we are still on schedule to deploy from Earth near the end of December. Big Boss responded, Thank you. Is there anything else you have to share? Jake replied, Oh, sure. Ladies and gentlemen, Apollo 1 is 100% complete. Everyone in the room stood up and began clapping. Jake continued, Jake, and more good news, Apollo 2 will only be six months behind us. The room erupted in applause once again. Big Boss added, 
We are expanding the frontier for humanity finally. He adjourned the meeting. After the meeting, Master Admiral Bishop Serbos and the Apollo 1 media announced to the world that Apollo 1 was completed ahead of schedule and that Apollo 2 and the 6th Fleet would follow six months later to join Apollo 1 and the 7th Fleet. The Admiral also announced that Apollo 1's destination was Kepler, the first near-Earth-sized planet that orbits around a star the size of the Sun, according to NASA exoplanets. Kepler 452 billion is 60% larger than Earth, and its parent star Kepler 452 is 10% larger than the Sun. Kepler-452 is very similar to our Sun, and the exoplanet orbits in the habitable zone. At 1.6 times the size of Earth, Kepler-452 billion has a better-than-even chance of being rocky, according to its discoverer's satellites. Kepler-452 billion is located 600 light-years away from Earth, and takes only 20 days longer than Earth to orbit its star. Master Admiral's journey to Kepler will take two months. Fast forward 60 days later, and we look above the Earth. The shadow of Apollo 1 is clearly visible from the ground. T minus 29 days, 4 hours, 32 minutes, and 14 seconds from now, the Apollo 2 months journey to the Kepler 452 billion system will begin. Kepler 452 billion is the first of many planets in the Milky Way galaxy that humans will explore. All ships are completing their final phase of checks and inspections. Currently, there are 10,835,244 civilians from over 80 nations that are now getting comfortable at their homes on board Apollo 1, not counting the births that are happening on board. Apollo 1 is a behemoth ship that can warp twice the speed of light and take its huge armada of ships with it. This is just one of the classified secrets of Apollo's technology. Six months later, Apollo 2 and the Sixth Fleet will double the size of Kepler's population bringing it to over 20 million. Just as there is Earth, there will be Kepler, the bigger sister of Earth. This marks the new dawn of mankind. Chapter 1 ends. Fade Out Chapter 2 By Pleo Fade In We find Alex, Sam, and Marshall talking over breakfast on the USSS Kennedy. Alex said, I know we have flown all over this solar system many times, but how do you feel about the big move of 600 light years from Earth to Kepler? That is one big ass move. Marshall responded, I know what you mean, it's like cutting the umbilical cord and detracting from Mother Earth. Sam said, you're right, but home is where your heart is. All our families are taking this journey with us. My best friends on Earth will soon be on Kepler with me. I love my job and there is no one better than me who will give their life to save humanity other than me. Wow, well said Alex. Alex then said, Here is a toast to our brother Sam, spoken so well. The three men held up their glasses of orange juice and said, Here's to our Uncle Sam. And they all burst into laughter. The three officers leave the dining room and head toward the gym to dip in the Olympic-sized swimming pool. While walking and talking, Alex's eyes drift toward a young female officer walking in the opposite direction. Alex slows his walk, making eye contact with the young lady. She pretty much turns his head. Before she gets on the elevator, she looks back at him, smiling with a big grin. She boarded the elevator. Alex looked at Sam and Marshall and asked who she was. Sam and Marshall smile at Alex and say, You poor little boy. How long have you been single, Alex? Alex said it's been a while, but who is she? Marshall noted that it was Lieutenant Regina or something like that. Alex smiled, so what does she do here? Sam said she works in the research department with monkeys like you. They laughed and walked into the gym. On the following week, Alex was walking out of the Black Squadron conference room. He saw the young woman again walking toward him. He stopped and paused waiting for her to come closer. Alex, excuse me, Lieutenant, she kept walking. He walked faster to catch up with her, he said, repeated Lieutenant. Once he caught up with her, she turned around and looked at him. He said, Lieutenant, excuse me, but wasn't you a Lieutenant last week? Alex said, congratulations, Lieutenant Commander. 
She responded to Alex, Well, I see you do pay attention to details. I like that. He raised his hand to salute her, and she said no. They then shook hands. She said, I'm Regina. He replied, I am Alex. She said, so you are a pilot, I see. Alex said, yes, I am, but I am new here. I have only been on board for a couple of months. Regina replies, that's why I've never seen you. Regina asked if they could talk later. I'm heading to a meeting. Alex said, sure, and they started to part ways. Alex stopped and yelled, Regina, what is your last name? She yelled back, Lance. Alex turned around with a huge smile on his face. Later that night, Alex and Regina had their first long conversation and fell asleep overnight on the comms. The following day, we find Regina and Alex having breakfast together in the dining room in a cozy little spot, talking and laughing. Later, Sam and Marshall walked into the dining room and saw Alex and Regina sitting alone in a cozy corner. So Sam and Marshall walked over and spoke. They both spoke to Alex and Regina. Good morning, Regina and Alex spoke back. Alex introduced Regina to Sam and Marshall. Marshall said to Alex, well, I guess Sam was right. Regina really does research on little monkeys, after all. Sam and Marshall laughed out loud. Regina said, huh? Alex said, never mind them. They hadn't had their happy meal this morning. Sam and Marshall congratulated Regina on her promotion. Regina told them thank you. Sam and Marshall said, well, we will let you two get back to doing whatever you were doing. They smiled and walked away. Regina said, so those are your friends. Alex said, yes. For the past 10 years, we go way back during high school. Later, Regina and Alex ended their breakfast and agreed to meet later. T minus 13 days, 9 hours, 10 minutes, and 44 seconds. Aboard the Apollo 1, headquarters of the High Command. Master Fleet Admiral Administration Office. Master Fleet Admiral Bishop Serbos, callsign Big Boss, is having his meeting with Chief Admiral Jake Tillis, callsign The Godfather. Bishop, so Jake, how are we looking? We are looking good, Jake replied. What level of flight speed are we talking about? Jake replied, one light year. Bishop asked, what do you think about that speed? Well, to be honest, Jake said, I'd rather we go at the speed of two light years. Jake explained, based on the timing of Apollo 2 coming, the terraforming will not be completed. Jake said I would rather have the Apollo 1 civilians moving down to Kepler before it too gets here. I spoke to the chief of the 6th Fleet and agreed to bring the Apollo 2 in at one light year speed, so they will slow down and arrive eight months after we go. At a two light year speed, we will be in orbit around Kepler in three weeks. Bishop replied, we do think alike. Jake smiled, we always have. Bishop asked Jake to send him a timeline for takeoff to landing appreciating the strategic foresight and responsibility of Jake's decision. Jake said that once we are in the orbit of Kepler, we will release the planetary satellites and probes in orbit that will cover the solar system. Cruisers and fighters will also scan and recon all other planets in the system. Once we have an all clear, the terraforming on the planet starts, and the terraforming from space will begin its terraforming. That will amaze the civilians to watch. All the other chiefs will be informed when their departments and the protocols can go into action. We will continue to cover the surface of Kepler in case of any issues with air power. Long term, once Apollo 1 has unloaded its civilians, the Apollo 1 will be transformed into battle mode and reconstructed. The first 10 Apollos will be reconstructed into a battle station. This should take two years to complete all 10 Apollos. We have 10,000 construction robots and all terraforming equipment, as well as parts for the terraforming and construction robots. Apollo 1 has 10,000 robots, and Apollo 2 will have more space to carry an additional 30,000 construction robots. So we will have more than enough. Bishop said, great. I love you on my team. Jake, we have been together for 30 years now. Bishop, it's been that long? Jake said, if not more. Bishop said, so, do you think we are going to run into any trouble? Jake replied, we will see, and if we do, 
I believe we have the best forces to handle anything. They would have to be gods to beat us. Jake said we come in peace, but we will defend humanity. Bishop replied, damn right. The two commanders ended their meeting. Fade out. Fade in. On board the USSS Kennedy, the officers are having a PT day a tradition where military officers and enlisted personnel engage in physical training. An announcement was made over the USSS Kennedy's intercom system, reminding officers of the PT schedule for the day. The schedule is as follows Black Squadron at 11, Red Squadron at 1,300, Green Squadron at 1,400, Blue Squadron at 1,500, Navy Special Ops at 1,000, Kennedy at Men's at 1,700, and Special Ops Ground at 1,800. The announcement also included tomorrow's PT schedules. Sam asked Marshall where Alex the muscle head was. Marshall said, I have no clue. Sam, it's 10.30. Sam said more likely to do a kissy face with Regina. And they both laughed. Marshall said, I don't think they kissed yet. Alex walked in at that point. Alex is six feet two inches tall a little shorter than his father, who is the big boss. However, at 250 pounds, Alex is just as handsome. He usually performs well in physical training events. During the event, Regina shows up as a spectator. Sam yells, Alex, I see your girl showed up to watch you fall on your face with those little tight shorts on Alex starts laughing. The fact is, Alex is a great athlete, and he did well, passing all of the PT requirements. Alex and Regina met for lunch, and during their meal, Regina asked Alex about his feelings for her. Alex paused to finish chewing and swallowing before responding. He asked if she really wanted to know his feelings after such a short time, to which Regina agreed that it was not fair to ask. However, Alex said he was happy to answer her and looked directly into her eyes. He admitted that this was the happiest time of his life. Alex said when he thinks about her, he gets so excited knowing she is a part of his life. Regina said, I love you and I want you to know I have the same feeling. Then she asked if we should meet each other's families and Alex agreed, saying that it would be a great idea. They both laughed and set a date. They agreed the following weekend. Their mutual understanding and respect for each other were evident in their decision to meet each other's families. Alex and Regina took a military transport bus to the Apollo 1. They met with her family, and they were very impressed with Alex, the Black Hawk. Regina's dad also used to be a pilot, so he was fine going by their call sign. A couple of hours later, Alex and Regina left for Alex's parents' home. They rang the door comms. Sandra and Sharon opened the door with big smiles and thanked Regina and Alex for coming. They went into the family room and continued talking about 30 minutes later. Nancy walked in and informed everyone that lunch was being served in the dining room. So everyone moved into the dining room, took their seats, and started talking again. Regina was feeling very happy and relaxed. Soon they heard the front door opening and footsteps approaching towards the dining room. Slowly the dining room opened Big Boss walked in, and Regina's eyes widened in surprise. Admiral Serbos, Regina said. Sandra replied, Honey, this is Alex's friend, Regina. Alex said, Do you know each other smiling? Regina turned to Alex and said, Why didn't you tell me your last name, Mr. Blackhawk? Everyone laughed. Big Boss explained that Regina works in the Apollo Research Center. Regina asked Alex, When did you plan to tell me your last name, Alex? Alex replied, well, it wasn't really that important. Sandra asked, How long have you two been dating, Alex said, almost three weeks. Sandra told Regina that if it was anything special to her, she was the first lady Alex ever brought home to meet them. Regina smiled and held Alex's hand. I have never taken anyone to meet my parents either, said Regina. Big Boss said, I have known Alex all his life and Regina for the past three years and I am very impressed with you both. Big Boss told Regina he did not want to discuss work during lunch, but he had a question. 
He asked her how was the advanced translators were working out. Regina replied that they were doing great. Big Boss then informed Regina that he planned to meet with her and the chief next week. Regina agreed and said it would be great. After finishing their meal, Sharon asked Regina if she wanted to see the pool. Regina accepted, and they headed over to the pool. Sandra looked at Alex Dam, Homer on Alex. Big Boss added she is a genius. She has an IQ off the charts. We just promoted her. Alex said I saw. Big Boss said I have to agree with your mom, Homerun. She is a keeper, my son. She is all class. I never thought of fixing two people up on dates, but she and you never crossed my mind and it was right under my nose. I guess Faith will always find a way. Big Boss said to Alex, so you be the first to know. Alex said know what? Big Boss said that in three days all Apollo Apollo personnel would have to report back on the Apollo to prepare for departure. Then Big Boss said you want the good news, Alex said. What's the good news, Dad? Big Boss said, instead of a two-month journey, your godfather Jake recommended we travel at a two-light-year speed, and we will be at Kepler in three weeks. Alex shouted yes, we will be very busy once we get there, said Big Boss. Sandra asked Alex, how do you feel about Regina? Alex said, I feel like I never felt before. Sandra said, yeah, that's what your dad told his dad. Big Boss said, and that is what I still tell him to this day. They all went out and sat around the pool. After a day out, Alex and Regina headed back to the USSS Kennedy. Alex asked Regina how she felt about the day, and she responded by kissing him. Looking into his eyes, she said, I love you. Lieutenant Alex Serbos. Alex returned the sentiment by saying, I love you too. Regina Lance with that, their night ended. Fade out. Fade in. There. T minus four days, five hours, 19 minutes and 30 seconds. Admiral Serbos and Admiral Tillis. The two men met in Big Boss office. Big Boss, welcome Jake. What do we have? Jake said, well, some big changes, but you decide how we are going to process this. The Apollo 2 can cut its time from eight to six months after it's completed. They have the option and warp light years, or use the classified jump. Big Boss asked what the pros and cons were. Jake said, well, there are very few cons about it. The big pros are we can get the 30,000 extra construction robots in, as well as additional military robots. I think it's better to jump them to Kepler, plus the military will double inside as well the population, which we can more than handle. I spoke with research, and they will be more than ready to complete the Kepler supper shields. The shields are reverse tech. Any attack on them will cause them to absorb the energy or bounce off. Research and the military have completed the DEFCON robots, Big Boss. I never liked that name, Jake continued. Not all battle robots are grounds-based, some can fly. Big boss, what are our ground attack forces? Jake smiles, well, you know we have the ability to cloak all ships well. Again, research is close to developing drop pods for all ground forces. We will have the ability to drop our ground forces pretty much undetected. Research is hard at making cloaking uniforms. Big boss, we need to make sure we keep that out of civilians' hands. Jake said we thought of that, too. All of those are still in development, but close to being completed. Big Boss, I will announce today that all Apollo Apollo personnel are to return to the Apollo in preparation to Kepler. I will give the 24-hour notice in about two hours. Jake, that's a good idea. Big Boss said the military would have 48 hours to say their goodbyes and report back on their ship. Big Boss asked Jake, how are you and Laura? Are you all good to go? Jake replied, we are set to go. How is Rod? Jake said his unit is 110%, and special ground ops is ready when needed. I spoke with General Case earlier. Big Boss said that's good to hear. Rod is Jake's son, a major in the Marine Corps, Special Ops Ground Force. Great work, Jake. Jake stood up, gave Big Boss a salute and exited the office. Two hours later, Big Boss broadcasted his fleet-wide announcement to all military personnel. Fade out. End of part two.
This will open Chapter 3. Fade in. T minus 4 days, 3 hours, 2 minutes, and 4 seconds. Over 2 hours since Big Boss made his military announcement. He met with his team again. Chief of Science and Research Chief Medical Doctor. Laktiva Mikhail from Russia. Chief General of Planetary Resources General Scott Young from USA. Executive Officer Master General of Civilian Military Personnel from the USA. General Semenya Li Yong from China will head up Chief Engineering and Communication. Chief Admiral of Transportation, Admiral Tosa Ryzen from Japan. Chief Admiral of the Fleet, Admiral Jake Tillis from the USA. Chief General of Ground Operations, General of the Army William Wright from the USA. Lady and Jens, do you have any questions before I start? General Yong said, I am delighted to hear that Apollo 2 will be close behind us, which will more than ensure that roads, bridges, and buildings will be far beyond the target dates we set. Kepler will be in full swing. The engineers are very happy to hear this. By next December, Kepler will have you thinking you are on Earth. Big Boss said thank you. Admiral Tillis was deep in on that with Apollo Command. There will be no waiting. As soon as Apollo 2 is boarded and ready, it will jump to Kepler in 60 seconds. What is taking us three weeks will take them 60 seconds. Jake said three weeks isn't bad for 600 light years. Big Boss said, Tosa Ryzen, I believe you also have a big announcement. Admiral Tosa Ryzen from Japan announced that by the time Apollo 1 reaches Kepler, all advanced translators will be issued to all pilots and officers of ground forces. By the first month after that, all military personnel will have translators. Big Boss, thanks, Tosa. That was a great project. It's crucial to me and the ground and air forces. Big Boss asked if anyone else would like to share. Big Boss said, Great, everyone, please meet with your loved ones, and let's go home to Kepler. The meeting adjoin. Big Boss returns to his office. He had a conference call scheduled with all ten of the Master Fleet Admirals of the Apollo projects. Big Boss will be the senior commander of all the Apollos. Apollo 2 Admiral Start of Canada will arrive in six months. Apollo 3 General Masters of the United European States U.S. will arrive on Kepler in seven months. Apollo 4 General Miloslav of the United Russian States will arrive in seven months. Apollo 5 Federations of Chinese States General Mike Ho will arrive in seven months. Apollo 6 Admiral Franks of the Australia Indo Zealand will arrive in seven months. Apollo 7 General Ziana of the Afro Union will arrive in seven months. And Apollo 8 General Eber Paulo from Brazil and the South American Unions will arrive in seven months. Apollo 9 Admiral Kenneth Stokes of the USA Big Boss brother in law and Sander brother. Arrival time of eight months Apollo 10 commanded by General Ali Hassan of the Middle East Union, arrival time of nine months. All Apollo commanders are on call. Big Boss was happy to give all the commanders a weekly status on Apollo 1. He informed everyone he had a great team, and they were locked and loaded to go to Kepler, he told everyone he wished they were on to make the maiden voyage. Master Fleet Admiral Start of Canada and the whole team wished them well. Start said they all know how hard you work to make this dream happen, and you should be the first to make this dream come true. Everyone over the comms started clapping and cheering. The call soon ended. Back aboard of the USS Kennedy, pay. Alex and Regina met in the corridor, and everyone was scrambling around them. Regina said to Alex, I just heard your father's announcement. Alex said, Me too. Regina said, I am going to head back to the Apollo tonight. I have a meeting in the morning in the translator project to finish up. She asked Alex if he could come to see her later on the Apollo. Alex responded that I would be on duty all day and tonight. Regina said, I understand. Jake said, I would be there first thing in the morning to see everyone and spend all day with you. I would love to see your lab. Regina said, that would be awesome, with a big smile. I love you, Alex. They kissed and parted ways. As Alex made his way to the Black Squadron deck, 
the squad chief delivered thrilling news. The black squad had just received the new Ravens, top class fighters in the entire military. The chief, his voice brimming with pride, urged Alex to revel in the excitement. Alex, his heart racing with anticipation, couldn't wait to lay his eyes on the new additions to their fleet. Stepping into the catapult tube, Alex prepared himself for the exhilarating ride. The fighter shot out at a staggering 12.5 Mach speed. These new Ravens were perfect for interceptors, boasting impressive cloaking abilities. The small size and quick maneuverability made blackouts a thing of the past. Alex, his senses heightened by the thrill, reveled in the surprises that came with the Ravens. He spent the night patrolling, his heart pounding with each mission. After Alex's amazing night ended, he returned to his quarter to shower, dress, and go to the transportation deck. Once on the Apollo, he took an air taxi home. He spoke with his mom and sister for a few hours and napped after a long night. Hours later, Alex woke. He talked to Sandra and told her he would see Regina and drop by his dad's office. Sandra said sure. She also asked him about Regina. How are things going with you and Regina? Alex, great. Sandra replies, tell me more than great, Alex. Mom, she is a wonderful woman. I adore everything about her. We spend a lot of time together. We are happy, Alex said. I hope we can make it to Kepler without each other. Alex smiled. I am sure you will, Sandra said. Alex soon left. He arrived at the research center and asked to see Miss Lance. Regina came to see Alex with a radiant smile on her face. Hello, Alex. Hey, Regina. They walked back to her office and Regina closed the door. She hugged Alex tightly, saying, I missed you so much. I tossed and turned all night. While Alex was holding her, he could feel her heart beating against his chest. Regina asked, Do you love me? Alex said at first sight. She said, Really? Alex said, you saw how I was looking at you. She said, yes. Alex asked what you were thinking. Regina burst out laughing and kissed Alex again. I said he was handsome, tall, and a hunk she laughed out loud. Regina asked, are you staying on Apollo tonight at your parents? Alex said, yeah, I guess. Regina said, I'd love to cook dinner for you tonight. Alex said, that would be great. Do you mind walking next door to see my dad with me? Regina said, I love to. They both walked next door to see Big Boss. They made it over, and Big Boss's assistant said he was expecting you and to walk right in. Alex and Regina knocked and walked into Big Boss's office. Big Boss greeted them. Well, come right on in, you two. Regina said, hello, Admiral. And Alex said, hello, Dad. Big Boss said, said, hello, Dad. Big Boss said, hello, you two. You two may have a seat. Alex and Regina sat at the round table in Big Boss' office. Regina said, I had a great time meeting your family, sir. Big Boss said, You welcome, Regina. We all enjoyed you as well. Big Boss asked Regina what her parents thought about Alex. She replied that they loved him with a smile. My dad had no sons, so he took to Alex right away. Big Boss said Sharon sounded like she found a big sister they talked about you, her, and Sandra for hours. Alex asked, so what do you think? I am thankful someone found you, Alex, for a minute. I thought you might spend the rest of your life with Sam and Marshall. They all laughed out loud. Big Boss said seriously that I have always been very impressed with Regina, and it honors me more that my son has found this remarkable woman. I seriously wish you two the best. Regina said, thank you so much for doing that. Alex said, thanks, Dad. Big Boss said, Alex, what do you think about those Raven fighters? Alex said, I had fun all night. It is all they said it was. Alex added that it slices through asteroids like butter. The 180 turn is madness. De Big Boss said, excellent. You guys loved it. You can thank Regina. She played a significant role in technology. Regina said, thank you for all the privileges you have given me. Big Boss said, we all count on you for a lot. Your skills and knowledge have made many young men and women safer and better. Big Boss asked, What plans do you all have for the night? Alex said Regina offered to cook tonight. Big Boss, that's great. 
Well, you two have a great time. We will be in Kepler before you know it. Alex, Regina, and Big Boss enjoyed their visit. Later that evening, Regina was home cooking dinner, and there was a buzz on her comms. She looked at the monitor and saw it was Alex. She touched a button on the monitor. The door opened, and a voice said, Please enter. Alex, Sir Boss Alex, entered. Regina yelled to Alex, I am in the kitchen. Alex found his way to the kitchen. He saw Regina standing at the kitchen counter preparing dinner. Alex said, Hello, sweetie. Regina turned around and smiled. Alex looked over at the dining table. He said, Wow, you are going all out for me. With a smile, Bill Regina says, Good food is the way to a man's heart, I heard. Alex said, You had my heart when I first saw you. Regina said, You had more than my heart at first sight. They both burst into a loud laugh. They took its seat at the table. Alex said, Regina, I am so impressed I have never had a candlelight dinner before. They had a wonderful dinner. They later entered the den area and relaxed together, all snuggling up. Alex said, I am so sorry. We didn't have time to visit your lab. Regina said it was okay. Come with me. They both headed downstairs and down a hall. She placed her eye against a peephole, and that door popped open. The comm said, Welcome, Lieutenant Commander Lance. Regina and Alex stepped into the vast laboratory. Alex, okay, this is far over my head. She laughs. Regina said, Most of the top researchers with Apollo have labs at home. Regina said, I trust you are good with secrets. Alex said, Yes, you know that. She showed him her lad and the project she was working on personally. Alex asked what this white uniform was for, which was body armor. Regina said yes and no. It's a cloaking body suit. I researched it over and over. Admiral Serbos wants it as a priority, so I am putting a lot of my time into it. I am impressed. But he doesn't know I am trying to add a force field with it. Alex replies I am at a loss for words, Regina. My dad was right about you. Your IQ is off the chart. Regina answered, do you think that? Alex said, my only question is why you want a simple pilot like me. Regina looked at Alex. I see far more than a simple man. Trust me. I see far more than you think. Alex and Regina left the lab. Alex said it was getting late, Regina, and they kissed in the hallway. Regina said to Alex, you're staying. Alex said, I am. Regina said, you are welcome. They headed to the bedroom. The next morning at the breakfast table, both were drinking coffee. Alex said, great coffee, Regina said. Is that all? They both laughed out loud. Regina and Alex spent the rest of the day together. T minus 30 minutes and 21 seconds. Chief Fleet Admiral Bishop Serbos reported to the bridge of Apollo 1. He then opened comms to the fleet, the civilians of Apollo, and all of Earth. Today we will start our journey to Kepler, and a new dawn of men will begin. We will take wisdom, hope, courage, the expansion of life, freedom for all beings, and a universe to learn from we leave Mother Earth, and take all she has given us, and use it for a better mankind. We will be 600 light years from Earth. We will be closer to Earth than you think. Instead of traveling the oceans, we will be traveling in space. As said over 700 years ago, from another Apollo. This is one step for man and one giant leap for mankind. We will see you soon. All the people from Earth looked up at the Apollo 1 and cheered loudly. At that point, the entire Seventh Fleet moved into position around the Apollo 1 mothership, and Apollo 1 slowly left Earth's orbit. From ground control, this is Apollo Saturn launch control from Earth. We are at T-10-9876-54321. The ship, a third the size of the moon, moved out of Earth orbit and kicked into warp drive. Apollo 1 blasted into warp drive two light years speed. The citizens of Apollo 1 never felt that Apollo moved. Big Boss from his command chair on the bridge. How are we doing? Rear Admiral Tucker said all systems are sound. We are in for a very smooth ride, sir. Big Boss said, excellent. Big Boss asked Tucker to bring Admiral Tillis on the comms. Tucker, yes, sir. 
Jake appears on the bridge screen. Jake, yes to the Admiral. Big Boss asked how are things with the fleet. Jake replied, smoother than a fat baby's ass everyone laughed on both ships' bridges. Big Boss said that's great, Jake. Big Boss said we will talk later. Jake said great. Big Boss said, out, and the bridge comms closed. Two weeks later, Big Boss held a command meeting. Jake, Big Boss, asked how soon the terraforming would start. Jake said ASOS, AAP. First all satellites and probes to Kepler would be released, scanning the entire planet below and above ground, just as we tested on the moon. After that, the Air Force will start sweeping the planet for any hostiles. Once it clears, other satellites and probes will be released to the remaining planets and asteroids. The cruisers and fighters will follow. This will happen quickly as soon as Apollo takes us out of warp. Once Apollo reaches Kepler, all space terraforming will start, followed by the ground terraforming giant robots. We plan to have this done in six weeks. Once that's done, the giant construction robots will be released, followed by all the air and ground defense robots. We will have all the civilians home within two months and begin the construction of Apollo into a battle station. Good said Big Boss. I will be handing you the Apollo Battle Station, Jake. Jake said, if all things stand, we are ahead of schedule. Jake said, and there is more news. I spoke with the Apollo 2 command, and they claimed to be four months from launch. Big Boss said, damn. So Admiral Start is keeping secrets from me. They all laughed on the comms call. Thanks, that's great news, Jake. They continued with the rest of the meeting. Big Boss spent the night at his command apartment, which was not far from the bridge. His comms goes off it's the bridge commander. Rear Admiral Tucker, he informs Big Boss that Apollo 1 has entered the solar system. Big Boss said great. I will be on the bridge in 15 minutes. Comms ended. Big Boss made it to the bridge, and the bridge screen was on. The screen showed at least 30,000 ships deployed all over the system. All ships, satellites, and probes were active and doing what they were designed to do. Jake came on over the comms, Admiral Tucker, sir. It's the USSS Kennedy, Admiral Tillis. Big Boss said, bring him up, please. Jake said, you mean you're not still in bed, boss? Big Boss laughed. He said to Jake, damn, Jake. It looks like a goon swarm out there. Everything is in motion, said Jake. By the time you get to Kepler orbit, it will be cleared and the terraforming will begin. Big Boss, that's awesome, Jake. Alex, Sam, and Marshall, along with the other 2,000 pilots of the Black Squadron, are covering a large gas-like planet about the size of Jupiter. It was located in a faraway area of the solar system. They are dropping probes onto the surface of the planet to begin scanning for any life forms and minerals. Alex, Sam, Marshall, and 100's other pilots were ordered to probe and scan the asteroid field near the planet. It was a very strange-looking asteroid field. Everything checked out well. All probes and satellites were deployed and locked into Apollo comms. The Black Squadron scanned the area for over 12 hours. The Black Squadron was ordered back to the USSS Kennedy. The next day, the ship-to-ship -ship operation returned. Jake and Big Boss were on comms. Jake said, can you believe how fast the terraforming is coming alone? Big Boss said, yes. Amazing at that point, Big Boss comms buzzed. It was Chief of Science and Research Chief Medical Doctor. Look, Tiva Mikhail. Big Boss, can you hold a second, Jake? Big Boss, yes, Doctor. Mikhail? Hey, sir, said Doctor. Mikhail, I would like to share some surface results we are getting in. Big Boss said I was talking to Jake. Do you mind if I add him to the call? Doctor, Mikhail said that would be great. Big boss, go ahead, Jake. Doctor, Mikhail is on the call as well. Hello, Doctor, Mikhail. Jake said hello. As I said to big boss, the terraforming is going ten times faster than I thought. Doctor Mikhail said, well, I will add to that. The planet is far more fertile than Earth. I think the crops on this planet will supply ten times more than Earth. We will be looking at bunker harvesting here on Kepler. Big Boss said that Kepler had pretty much secured mankind. 
Also, the oxygen level is better than Earth. Big Boss said, let's make sure we keep this planet clean. We hit the gold mine for life. Doctor. Mikhail, well, we also struck gold, platinum, and some other very different ores all over the planet. Big Boss replied, you kidding, right? Doctor. Mikhail, we will send you a report within 24 hours. Doctor. Mikhail left the comms a little later. Jake told Big Boss, well, we can always go into gold mining, boss. Big Boss laugh. Everything so far is good. Kepler is home, Jake. Jake and Big Boss ended their call. Jake met with his commanders to set a patrol schedule for the solar system at least 4,000 pilots daily on 12-hour shifts. He said we would reduce the schedules over time once we had the advanced star stations. Also, early warning systems, guns, and other defense batteries are in place. After Alex made it back on board the Kennedy, he went to his quarters for a shower and crawled into bed. His comms come on, and it's Regina. Alex said, hello. Regina said, I know you had a long night, and I want to say I love you and get some rest. Alex Alex smiled and said, I feel the same, Mrs. Sir Boss. Regina paused with her mouth open. She said, what? Alex said, I want to get used to saying that. Regina said, well, I want to get used to hearing that. They both laughed. Regina said, it's been hard being away from you, Alex said the same. Regina asked, so, how hard is it out there? Alex said, it's about the same, but with different sizes of planets and asteroids. Alex said, but one strange-looking asteroid field looked odd and out of place. We patrol through it many times. So far, it's just a regular patrol. Regina said, do you see how fast the terraforming is going? Alex said, it's amazing fast. Regina asked Alex what time he would be back on patrol tonight. Alex said around 8 p.m. I am unsure what time we will get days off. Regina said, I know. A lot is going on everywhere. Regina and Alex ended their meals and caught a movie later before ending the night. Four months later. The day starts with Big Boss in his office. Admiral Tillis walks in. Both men salute each other. Jake took a seat. Big Boss looked at Jake with a big grin on his face. Big Boss, let's call Admiral Start. Jake smiled, yes, let's do that. Big Boss made the call. Admiral Start picked up the comms. Big Boss said to Start, Hey, buddy, how's it going? Start said, Just another day here on Earth. Big Boss said, Do you mind bringing me a bottle of my favorite bottle of wine? Start said, Sure, it'll take about two more months. Is that okay? Big Boss said, No. I'm afraid that won't work two months is too long. Big Boss asked how it would be in the next hour. Jake and Big Boss started laughing on the comms. Start said, Who told you that? Big Boss said, I have spies all over Apollo 2, and all the men started laughing. Admiral Start said, Well, I have another surprise for you, and you're going to love it. Big Boss said, What it is, Start said, We are not bringing in that additional 40,000 vessels, but 60,000, putting the fleet over 100,000 ships. Boss and Jake started cheering. Big Boss said, You are kidding me. Start. Start said, see you in an hour and hung up. Jake said, that was much needed. Our pilots and troops needed a big break. Jake said, I needed to return to my office and send the Apollo 2 troop command schedules and updates. Big Boss said, awesome, Jake, get on it. Jake grabbed his iPhone and dashed out of the office. Over 10 million civilians are now living on Kepler. Apollo 1 is almost done refitting into a battle starship. Four space stations are active in the solar systems, and defense weapons are positioned throughout the system. Early warning systems are all over the galaxy and outside of it. Kepler now has significant cities, towns, communities, new homes, streets, sporting complexes, shopping, hospitals, crops, and agriculture in abundance. Soon, the trading routes between Earth and Kepler will begin. In the next hour, Apollo 2 jumped into Kepler orbit. The citizens from the ground were very confused, seeing two Apollos in orbit. No one was expecting Apollo 2 for another two months. Just like the Apollo 1 fleet did when entering that system, Apollo 2 deployed 50,000 ships all over the system. 
This will allow some well-needed rest for Apollo 1 and get much-needed time off to see their families. Kepler now has over 100,000 vessels in the system. A month later, the rest of Kepler was terraformed. Jake, Will, Start, and Big Boss met in Big Boss's office. Will Smith holds the same position with Start as Jake does with Big Boss. The other Apollo commands were on the call. Their main concern was where to position the rest of Apollo's colonies once they reached Kepler. Apollo 1 and 2 form a large city and suburbs that cover much of the coastline, rivers, and huge agricultural areas. The city was named Kepler City and later became the capital, with many other cities and towns nearby. The large beach was spectacular. Each other, the new arrivals Apollos would colonize wherever they agreed on, as long as it was not in a major resource area. All cities and towns will be connected by micro-speed rails. There will be space flights as well for the future Apollos for tourism and visitors. Earth will be only 60 seconds away. Now Kepler was home for good. Two months have passed and the second Apollo has been fitted as a battle station above Earth. Admiral Jake Tillis is now Chief Fleet Admiral of the Apollo 1, and Admiral Tucker is now in command of the USSS Kennedy and has been promoted to Vice Admiral. Big Boss is now the supreme commander of all Kepler Solar System's forces. The headquarters are located near downtown Kepler City, along with all the departments that served on board the Apollo 1. Apollo 3, Apollo 4, Apollo 5, Apollo 6, and 7 will be in orbit above Kepler at the locations they agreed on. In the next month, Kepler's population will be near 100 million. In the next five years, Kepler hopes to reach 6 billion people. Earth's population is still too high, so the push to populate the Milky Way is still a priority. We find Alex Serbos talking with Regina in his quarter on the comms. They have been discussing the best locations to live on Kepler. They agree to be near the beach because both grew up on or near it. Regina said we have been discussing a house for a month now. So, are we going to be roommates or what? Alex said I've been calling you Mrs. Serbos for a while now. Regina said I only know one Mrs. Serbos. That's your mom. Alex said you are right. I will be down at Kepler and come over later this morning. Regina said, excellent, I will see you then. Alex reached the transportation deck and arrived at his parents' home. He rang the door comms, Nancy opened the door. Nancy said, morning, Alex. Good morning, Nancy. Alex saw everyone was around the pool having breakfast. He entered the pool area and spoke to everyone. Big Boss, Sandra was at the breakfast table, and Alex joined in. Big Boss, what brings you to the wonderful city of Kepler? Sandra, why didn't you bring my daughter-in-law? Alex said that's what I wanted to talk about. Sharon, really, you're getting married. Alex looked at Sharon. What? Sandra said, and why not? I don't want to be a grandmother at 100. Big Boss looked at Sharon and said, You are not grown till you are 50. Everyone laughed aloud. Big Boss said to Sandra, Well, isn't that a little early? He is just 25. Sandra Bishop, we got married at 20. Sandra said, I can tell they are deep in love. Alex smiled. Sandra said, You know this family has a long history of getting married very early. Why is that? Sandra said, Because we have a history of long life and long love together. Both your granddaddy was married at 20, and so were your dad and I. So I think you are old at 25, Alex. It's another year, said Sandra. Sandra said, let's take a family vote who's in favor of Regina. Sandra said, Big Boss and Sharon both yelled I. Alex said, I. Sandra said, I think the eyes has it. Four eyes and no nose. Everyone laughs. Nancy the android came from the house and brought Alex an engagement wedding ring magazine. Everyone laughed out loud, Sandra said. Even Nancy agreed that five to zero Alex. The family sat around the table and decided to pick out rings with Alex. Sandra said, let's add another family member to our Sir Boss huddle. Alex ordered a beautiful, stunning ring. Alex said, wonderful, it will be here tomorrow. Everyone cheers, hey, later Alex went to visit Regina. 
Alex made it to Regina's once she opened the door. He grabbed, hugged, and kissed her for a long time. Regina said, wow, I really needed that. Alex said, I needed it more. Let's do something special today. Where would you like to go? Regina said, anywhere with you. Alex said, well, let's go. They went for a nice country drive to a very special restaurant to the mall and took photos together. They also drove to the beach and just watched the sunset. While lying on the beach, looking up at the stars, Regina said, Alex, I don't want anything else in my life. I have it all with you. Alex said, my life begins with you. Whenever you think or miss me, we both can look at the stars and meet. I will be there looking back at you like I am now. Regina said, that is so sweet, Alex. Alex said, I love you so much. I have such a big drive in my heart to get to you. My heart races to you. Regina looks at Alex with tears in her eyes. They both sat holding hands, and with tears in both of their eyes, they gently kissed. Regina said, let's go home. Alex and Regina spent the night together. The next morning, Alex kissed Regina goodbye. Alex said, I will call you from the Kennedy. Regina said, okay, you are too handsome. She walked Alex to the door. It was Sunday. Alex asked her what she was doing for the day. Regina said she was going to visit her parents and sisters. They kissed again when Alex Transportation's taxi arrived. Alex returned to the USSS Kennedy called Regina and said good night. Black Hawk Down, Tay. Returning to that USSS Kennedy, the Black Squadron was brief for their 10-hour shift. All pilots were in the Black Hawk conference room. The squadron chief gave everyone orders, everyone saluted and headed to the catapult tubes. Lieutenant Alex Serbos, callsign Blackhawk, had the lead tonight, followed by Lieutenant Samuel Gills, callsign Jack Jumper, and Lieutenant Marshall Smith, callsign Sniper. Both will be Alex Wingman. All Black Squadron pilots headed to the catapult tubs. Alex, Sam, and Marshall give each other a high five and yell at each other their war cry. Night stalkers of no fear. The three pilots enter this catapult tubes. Alex had the lead and thrust from the catapult tube first followed by Sam and Marshall. All fighter race information toward the asteroid field Victor. The Night Stalkers came in fast. They turned on their scanners and released pods and probes. Sam, everything is clear, Alex and Marshall responded. Roger Jack Jumper. Alex said, let's maintain formations and sweep the field. All three pilots drove into the asteroid field. Jack Jumper, we have all clear. They continue to scan the Victor fields. Alex's report on comms, USSS Kennedy, the Victor is clear the Kennedy. Roger the Black Hawk. Alex, Sam, and Marshall continue their patrol in the Victor field. Hours had passed, and the shift was nearly over. Marshall said, So, Alex, when is the wedding date? Alex said, What date? Sam said, Come on, man, we know it's coming. I want to know who's going to be the best man. Alex said, neither of you clowns. Marshall said, let me guess. Both Sam and Marshall said big ball and laughed out loud. Alex contacted the Kennedy comms. To the USS Kennedy, this is Blackhawk's permission to return the Kennedy. Roger Blackhawk's permission to return. Alex said to Sam and Marshall, who was ready for a nice cold brew. Alex said, Let's make our exit near the big asteroid and head home. All pilots made their turn for the Kennedy. Alex was the lead fighter at that point. A huge blast came from the big asteroid. At that moment, Alex attempted to evade the incoming attack, but his ship was destroyed in an instant. Same and Marshall immediately took evasive action and started searching for Alex's ship during their maneuvers. Meanwhile, Jack Jumper reported to the Kennedy with urgency, Mayday, Mayday, Black Hawk down. Black Hawk is down. Ailes is down. Both pilots were devastated by the news and Marshall cried out, No, Alex. Alarms on all the 7th Fleet went off. The Kennedy all hands on deck, pilots to your stations. The bridge of Apollo 1 and 2 repeat, warp drive in effect. The alarm was ringing all over the 6th and 7th Fleets. Within 30 seconds, at least 25,000 ships arrived near the asteroid field and the explosion was clear to all. 
Admiral Tillis was home and was informed there was an explosion or possible attack on a fighter. Tillis left immediately. He arrived 40 minutes later on the Apollo 1. Tillis asked to give me a status. Comms came on, sir, this Captain Heron of the Special Ops. Recovery. Admiral Tillis, Charles, what do you have, sir? We have only picked up the wreckage. No body has been recovered, no emergency pod, nor the black box. We found wreckage on the asteroid, but just wreckage the recuse ships have deployed farther out for any recovery. Jake to Charles, can you confirm the pilot? The wreckage and flight log confirm it was Lieutenant Alex Serbos, Admiral Serbos's son. We will continue to turn over every rock and space particle. Sir, we have the video footage from both pilots that were with Lieutenant Serbos. They are on board the Kennedy. Jake responded, Keep looking. Charles the captain said we all night or longer if we have to. Jake said thanks. This will end Chapter 3. Fade Out Chapter 4 Fade In Admiral Tillis's heart was hurt and saddened, knowing he had lost his godson, and he was even more disappointed he had to break the news to his best longtime friend and family. Jake was filled with tears and had to give himself time to get his mind together. Rod, Jake's son, met him on air transport. They took a military jet craft down to the Kepler air station, and from there he took a military air jet. Rod comforts his dad. The Tillis and Serbos family are very close. They arrived at the Serbos residence. Jake and Rod walked to the door and rang the comms button. Nancy answered the door and let Jake and Rod in. Nancy said the family was in the family room watching TV. Jake and Rod walked into the family room. The scene remains that in the open foyer you hear the footsteps of Jake and Rod walking into the large family room. A few minutes later you hear the screams and cries of the Serbos family. The scene blacks out. Admiral Tillis listened intently as Captain Heron's voice crackled through the office comms aboard the Apollo 1. The weight of the situation hung heavily in the air as they discussed the ongoing recovery efforts. Good morning, Captain Heron Admiral Tillis replied, his tone grave with concern. Thank you for the update. It's disheartening to hear about the lack of progress. Any leads on the cause of the blast? Heron's voice came through, tinged with frustration. Sir, so far we've only managed to recover pieces of the wreckage from the Black Hawk fighter. We scanned and probed beyond the blast point, but there's no sign of Lieutenant Serbos or the black box. We're still in the process of recovery. Admiral Tillis furrowed his brow, a sense of unease settling in the pit of his stomach. And what about the report from Lieutenant Serbos? Was there anything significant in it before it was vaporized? Heron's response was grim. Sir, the report was lost in the blast. It's possible that something otherworldly or an unknown force within the victor field is at play here. At this point, we have to face the reality that Lieutenant Serbos may be gone. Admiral Tillis sighed heavily, the weight of the situation bearing down on him. Despite the lack of answers, he knew they couldn't afford to lose focus. Continue with the recovery efforts, Captain. We need to find answers, even if they're difficult to face. Keep me updated on any developments. With a sense of determination, Admiral Tillis ended the communication stealing himself for the challenges that lay ahead in unraveling the mysteries of the Victor Field and uncovering the fate of Lieutenant Serbos. I have a meeting with Lieutenant Gills and Smith later today. You are welcome to join. Jake said, thanks, I will, Charles. I think Admiral Serbos will join. Captain Heron said the meeting is at 11 a.m. this morning. Their call ended. The research building on Kepler hummed with activity as scientists and researchers worked diligently on their projects. Among them was Regina, immersed in her work at a research computer, her focus unwavering until the entrance of a familiar figure disrupted the calm. Good morning. Admiral Serbos a voice greeted as Big Boss entered the room. Regina, turning with a bright smile, echoed the sentiment with genuine warmth, her excitement evident in her expression but the jovial atmosphere shattered as Big Boss approached, his somber demeanor casting a shadow over the room. 
A concerned voice from the lab called out, sensing the shift in mood. With a heavy heart, Big Boss enveloped Regina in a tight hug, seeking solace in her presence. Her cheerful demeanor faltered as she sensed the gravity of his embrace. What's wrong? Regina's voice quivered with concern, her smile fading as she repeated the question, her eyes searching his for answers. In a trembling voice, Big Boss delivered the devastating news. He silently said that Alex was no longer with us. Regina's world seemed to crumble around her as she processed the words. Shock and disbelief painted her features before giving way to raw anguish. With a piercing scream, Regina collapsed, overwhelmed by the weight of her grief. The air filled with a palpable sense of loss as those around her watched, their own hearts heavy with sorrow for the loss of Alex, a beacon of light extinguished far too soon. A couple of hours later, in the dimly lit conference room of Apollo 1, the atmosphere was heavy with grief and exhaustion. Big Boss, flanked by his trusted companion Jake, entered the room where Sam and Marshall awaited them. The fatigue etched on their faces mirrored the weariness felt by everyone present, a testament to the gravity of recent events. As they exchanged somber greetings, it was evident that the loss they shared weighed heavily upon them. Captain Heron and his team, standing nearby, also offered their condolences to Admiral Serbos, acknowledging the pain of their collective loss. Without hesitation, Big Boss approached Sam and Marshall, enveloping them both in a tight embrace. Tears flowed freely as they held onto each other, finding solace in their shared sorrow. In a moment of unity, Big Boss whispered words of solidarity, Night Stalker of no fear. Their voices trembled as they echoed his sentiment, repeating the oath with conviction. Night Stalkers of no fear it was a vow forged in the crucible of grief, a pledge to honor the memory of those they had lost and to face the challenges ahead with unwavering courage. Later they all took their seats. Captain Heron gave everyone the report of the recovery efforts they showed the photo and the incident from Sam and Marshall two fighters. Captain Heron stated that we do not know everything in this system, and they are still learning. He turned on the video and audio comms of the Black Knights in formation as they maneuvered in the Victor asteroid field. As the video displayed Lieutenant Serbos fighter, Captain Heron slowed down the video. He said, what everyone was seeing was a space intake blast. They saw it before, but that's what they are calling it. They watch slowly as the blast force pulls the lieutenant fighter inward and blasts out. Big Boss asked Heron what he would make of it. Heron said it looked like the worst due to it pulling in and then out, which is the worst blast. Heron said I would love to send a few dozen science and drill bots on the asteroids. Jake said anything you need, Charles. Jake said he would also post a carrier near the planet and Victor's asteroid field. Jake said everything found there is classified, and he wants to have a weekly report on his desk until the case is closed. The meeting adjourned. Jake and Big Boss walked down the corridor. Jake asked Big Boss how the family was holding up. Big Boss said, not good, but they understand well about a military left for family and career. It's still no different than any family once it happens. Jake said, I understand. Jake said, I will forward you every report I receive. Big Boss said, I know you will, Jake. They saluted each other, and Big Boss left the Apollo back to Kepler. The last thing Alex recalled was that he was flying at high speed, his weapons open at rapid fire. He was hit, and a voice said, Welcome, Lieutenant Serbos. You have entered the domain of the ancients. Prepare to face your destiny, and with that ominous pronouncement, the world went dark. Regina is sitting alone in her office, crying, hurt, and in disbelief. She feels as though her life has ended with Alex's death. He was the man she wanted to spend the rest of her life with, the man she loved unconditionally. Now, with Alex gone, she feels it was her own fate. Her eyes are closed, and tears continue to pour down her face. Everyone around her can hear her crying. A couple of her friends enter her office to console and hold her. Regina says that she just needs to go home and rest. One of her co-workers offers to drive her, 
while another suggests that Regina shouldn't be alone in her condition. Regina tells them where she would like to go. Meanwhile, the big boss is in his office and receives calls from all over the fleet, including Kepler and Earth. He asks his assistant to hold all his calls. Later, he informs his assistant that he is taking a few days off. The big boss heads out to console Sandra and Sharon. Later, at the Sir Boss home, Nancy answers the door. She greets Regina and tells her that Sandra and Sharon are in the family room. Regina walks into the family room crying. Sandra and Sharon grab and hold Regina as she cries, and then all three ladies start crying together. Later, Big Boss made it home. Regina was asleep on one couch, and Sharon was asleep on another couch. Sandra was awake with her head down but watching TV. Big Boss walks into the family room and sits next to her. He said, for the first time, I felt worthless at work. Just sitting in my office wasn't taking any calls. We needed a few days together, Sandra said she understood. She said her sister Pam and Jake's wife Laura were making all the arrangements. The memorial will be in two days. Big Boss asked how Sharon and Regina were doing. Sandra said they both were in a wreck. We are all taking this very hard as you are, Bishop. I heard you in the basement alone last night. Sandra smiled at Big Boss while rubbing his shoulder. They both smiled at each other with tears in their eyes. Sandra asked Big Boss if they should offer Regina if she wanted to stay in Alex's bedroom. Big Boss said she is welcome as long as she wants. Two days later, during the memorial, over 8,000 military personnel and 10,000 civilians came to show respect to Alex and the Sir Boss family. Many people spoke of Alex and the kind man he was. Sandra spoke, and many other family and friends. Big Boss spoke last. He gave a heartfelt power speech about Alex that had everyone in tears. At the end of his speech, he walked over to Regina, gave her a small box, and said, Alex wanted you to have this. He bought this for you on the day he passed. Regina stood up and hugged Big Boss, and her tears never stopped flowing. Regina opened the box, saw the engagement ring, and collapsed. Weeks later, Regina grappled with the loss of Alex she found solace and purpose in throwing herself back into her work. With each passing day, she felt the weight of grief slowly lifting, replaced by a renewed sense of determination and focus. Returning to her research with a newfound intensity, Regina immersed herself in the complexities of her projects, poring over data, analyzing results, and pushing the boundaries of scientific discovery. The familiar rhythm of her work served as a balm for her wounded spirit, providing a sense of structure and meaning in the wake of tragedy. Though the pain of Alex's absence lingered, Regina found comfort in the pursuit of knowledge, channeling her grief into a driving force for progress. She honored his memory with each breakthrough and innovation, knowing that he would have wanted nothing more than to see her thrive. After a month passed, Regina delved deeper into her work. She found herself once again at the forefront of scientific exploration, her mind ablaze with possibilities and her spirit buoyed by the promise of discovery. With each step forward, she moved ever closer to unlocking the mysteries of the universe, guided by a sense of purpose that transcended grief and loss. She still hasn't gotten the military suit to cloak to work yet. As Regina returned to the USSS Kennedy, she found herself surrounded by familiar faces, including Sam and Marshall, who had both been promoted to lieutenant commanders. The sight of her comrades brought a bittersweet mix of emotions, reminding her of the bond they shared with Alex and the adventures they had embarked on together. With a shared understanding of the pain they had endured, Regina, Sam, and Marshall made plans to reconnect over lunch, seeking solace and companionship in each other's company. As they gathered around the table, Memories of their time with Alex flooded back, filling the air with laughter and nostalgia. Over plates of food and glasses of wine, they reminisced about the fun times they had shared, recalling the inside jokes, the daring missions, and the moments of camaraderie that had forged their friendship. Despite the ache of Alex's absence, there was comfort in the shared memories, a reminder that his spirit lived on in the bonds they had formed. 
In the end, Regina found solace in her work and the support of her friends. She honored Alex's memory by striving for progress and pushing the boundaries of scientific discovery. Though the pain of Alex's absence remained, Regina knew that she was not alone in her grief and that the love and bond she shared with Alex would always endure. Admiral Jake Tillis and Admiral Bishop Serbos have been holding meetings to discuss the future of the Apollo fleet. Jake's masterminded plan for the Apollo fleet and the development of Kepler holds immense potential for economic growth and population management. By harnessing Kepler's resources, particularly through trade and acquisition, Earth can alleviate its population pressures while tapping into the wealth of the distant worlds. The strategic transformation of the Apollo ships into fleet stations is a significant step towards establishing a permanent presence in Kepler orbit, enabling ongoing trade and resource extraction operations. This expansion bolsters Earth's economy and paves the way for Kepler's development as a hub for education, military growth, and retirement. Jake's optimism about attracting more people to Kepler underscores the potential for the planet to become a destination for individuals seeking opportunities beyond Earth. The establishment of shipyards in orbit and on the ground further enhances Kepler's appeal by creating job opportunities and fostering economic growth. The laughter shared between Jake and Big Boss at the prospect of utilizing Earth's resources to fuel Kepler's expansion speaks to their confidence in the plan's viability and their shared vision for the future. Jake also said Earth is planning another Apollo deployment for a new system within two years. Big Boss said that would be awesome. Big Boss and Jake later ended their meeting. That later, Big Boss walked over to the research center next door to see Regina, hoping they could have lunch together. He wanted to check on her after the death of Alex, and it would be great to spend some time with his almost daughter-in-law. Regina informed him that things were going well at work. She also asked if it would be possible to come over this weekend and if everyone would be home. Big Boss agreed and said he wanted to try out his new grill. Captain Heron is now on the phone with Jake. Jake asked, do you have anything for me? Charles said we swept that area for six weeks. You read the weekly reports that we sent. The scheduled fighter is still patrolling Victor Field. Everything is all clear. Jake said, well, we will pull back the carrier and replace it with a cruiser for now. Captain Heron said he would send Jake his final report. As of this point, they will close Lieutenant Alexander Serbos's case. Jake agreed, and they ended the call. The last thing Alex recalled was that he was flying at high speed, his weapons open at rapid fire. He was hit, and a voice said, but Welcome, Lieutenant Serbos. You have entered the domain of the ancients. Prepare to face your destiny, and with that ominous pronouncement, the world went dark. Later, Alex was found in a sanitized room, a depressurized room being observed through black glass windows. Next, he recalled, any monitors, computer systems, and other electronics hum with activity inside the room. Four enigmatic figures, unmistakably alien in their appearance, glide through the room. One of them, with a deliberate slowness, begins to undress and scrutinize the human body. A small sample of hair, skin, and blood is delicately extracted. The eyes are meticulously scanned. A translator device, boots, and a black helmet are removed and each item is taken to a separate room. The aliens depart, leaving a body on the table. As the view of the room expands, the body is revealed to be that of Alex Serbos. When Alex regains consciousness, he finds himself in a room devoid of doors or a floor, with only a tray of vegetables for consumption. The passage of time is a blur. A week later, we find Alex unconscious on a table, he was transfused of half his blood and transfused with a blue form, a blue liquid or blues. Later, still confused with time, he was again placed in a room with no floors and walls. In the room, there was a table with liquid food. Alex consumed it as well. Two more weeks passed and Alex was unaware if anything had been done to him. All he recalls is no floor or walls and food that lacks flavor. He remains lost in time. Was it a day that passed or years? Alex was found unconscious again. 
we find Alex on a table. His head was shaved, and the four doctors operated on his head. There on the table were several pen head size implants being inserted into his brain. Some strange sounds began to explode near the area, and then it stopped. The four aliens looked at each other and continued to operate at a faster pace. Later, the aliens returned to the lab and scanned Alex's eyes with blue, red, and green lights. They then placed a clear shield over his face. They left the room, and the lights automatically turned off. As Alex regained consciousness, he found himself disoriented, surrounded by an abundance of food and the sounds of chaos echoing through the room. The sight of the walls and floor offered little comfort, and the distant rumble of a ground battle only added to his confusion. Struggling to make sense of his surroundings, Alex's senses sharpened as he heard the unmistakable sound of footsteps approaching. Something else, a frantic scrambling, joined the cacophony, heightening his sense of urgency. Summoning all his strength, Alex pushed himself up, determined to find a way out of the room and uncover the source of the commotion. But before he could take a single step, his body betrayed him, collapsing to the floor with an unexpected and alarming weakness. As he lay there, vulnerable and bewildered, questions raced through his mind. What had happened to him? Where was he? And what was the nature of the battle raging outside? With no answers in sight, hoping for clarity to emerge from the chaos surrounding him. Alex went into a daze again. Later, after he had awakened, you noticed that he was dressed again and in full gear. He continues to drift in and out. The last thing he remembers seeing was an oval, round machine in a green, watery wetland. He was rushed into this vessel. A battle was still raging and getting close to Alex. The machine started to spin, and flashes of purple, red, and yellow light started flashing and spinning. The battle was getting closer just before Alex blacked out. A voice came to Lieutenant Serbos. Emerge and prepare to face your destiny. Alex emerged from the darkness and into the light, but something was different about him. He was now fully armed with weapons attached to his body, and he had a black motor spaceship nearby. He heard screams and cries of children coming from a distance. As he looked around, he saw that a tall, lizard-like creature was attacking the town. Many creatures were attacking from the ground while an air bombardment tore through the city. Alex quickly flew into the city as the creature broke through the blockades. He jumped from his space jet and landed on the ground, only to notice that red blood covered the streets. Suddenly, fifty Lazard men rushed toward Alex, but he quickly pulled out a long sword from his back plate. As soon as he touched the sword, it turned a beaming red. Alex took one sweep of his sword and split all fifty men in half. He then proceeded to move towards the thousands of other lizard creatures, destroying hundreds and thousands of them. Alex found that he could leap at least sixty feet high to avoid the attackers and gain higher ground on a building. There, he pulled out a big rifle from his back plate and fired it, causing a big electrical burst on the streets and killing many of the lizard men. Alex then saw a family being attacked and surrounded by lizards. Alex ran and jumped in front of the family, shielding them and himself. Pulling his blade, he cleared the way until the family was safe. As they moved forward, Alex saw more people fighting the lizards. These beings looked more human, but their skin was slightly purple, and they had white hair. They were about a foot shorter than humans. Alex used his sword to clear a path, killing every lizard that stood in his way. The purple citizens saw Alex clearing the path toward them and started shooting the lizards to help him through. Alex destroyed all the lizards that stood before him, and the rest started to retreat. Somehow Alex understood what the purple people were saying. Alex discovered that the purple people were known as the Bonsolans, while the lizards were called Zykonans. The Bonsolans had once ruled a faraway galaxy called Solmon, which was eventually conquered by the Garantines' alliance. The Zykonans were a pack of dogs obeying the Garantines' orders, armed with deadly claws and bites. They were created through evil research by the Garantines' empire, which controlled over 100 galaxies with their uncontested fleets. 
Alex was curious to learn more about this world in the universe. The Bonsalan's leader, Tazi, advised Alex to move as far away as possible. When asked where he was from, Alex couldn't recall. He only remembered finding himself in an open field, watching the town being attacked, and hearing screams from women and children. Alex asked if the Bonsalans were planning to stay and fight, but Tazi said they were moving to a far-off solar system to escape and live free. Though billions of Bonsalans existed, they were scattered across the universe. Tazi thanked Alex for his help, addressing him as all-powerful Alex, but Alex humbly replied that he was not a hero, only willing to help when needed. The next day, Tazi invited Alex to travel with them, but Alex declined, still searching for his own home. As the Bonsalan ships lifted into the skies and escaped undetected, Alex returned to his space jet. Suddenly everything went black, and a voice addressed him as Lieutenant Serbos praising him for his kindness to the weak, as shown through his deeds as the ancients. Well done, the voice said. Things went dark again. Alex could hear voices.